أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Yes, now I So alhamdulillah we have Sheikh Abdullah Wadur visiting us from Dallas, Texas. He's part of the Bayina Institute. He is a very uh, well known in the Houston area. He grew up and was raised in the Houston, Texas. Also studied at the University of Medina, studied Sharia as well. Um, alhamdulillah the topic is raising our children in the Muslim community. And so without further ado, here's uh, Sheikh Ustaz Abdullah Wadur. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبيه الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي إن شاء الله تعالى I plan to embark upon this topic of raising the youth in America and it's a broad topic but it's a very important topic and usually when I give these talks to parents or to youth, if the intended audience is one or the other, I always give it to both. Uh, because when you're giving it to one, you're indirectly giving it to the other. When you're giving it to one, you're indirectly giving it to the other. So when you speak to the youth, you're talking to the parents also indirectly. And when speaking to the parents, it's also advice for the youth. So when talking about raising our children in America, there's um, important components here our children and America. And obviously we added this, this tone America because there is a concern about the environment of America upon our children from an, a, a standpoint of being Muslim. Realizing that there may be some contradictory practices from our children or around our children when it comes to implementing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. So we know that this is a very important topic, but at the same time, there are some guidelines that myself, being someone that was raised here, uh, I see that are, are very important. And it's very, very important when talking about raising children and wanting to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to please God, you have to be practical. And I don't want to use the word practical to lessen the sanctity or the greatness of the Quran and the stories of the Quran and the lessons from the Quran or the Sunnah. No, but actualizing, acting out the Qur'an and the Sunnah in the best way possible to the best of our ability with the maqasid, with the uh, Islamic objectives. And understanding these objectives are general and they're wide. How we implement these objectives may differ when it comes to place, time, and custom. And this is very important. So when we're talking about raising the youth in America, firstly, I want y'all to know who's sitting in front of me. Like the brother said, mashallah, and my name is Abdullah Waduro. I'm your brother in Islam, your uncle, your friend. Uh, I embraced Islam around 1997. And before that, uh, there were practices that were not Islamic, to say the least. And I was in a household being the first, and still am, the first American in my lineage. My parents come from Ghana. My father is from Accra. My mother is from Kumasi. Accra is the capital of Ghana. It's in West, Western Africa. And my, my mother is from a small village. You know, usually, mashallah, we see, you know, if you come here to America, you're from the capital or both from the village. You come here first, right? You get your career or you get your scholarship and your wife is sitting at home. She's, well, she's doing this. She's not doing this, right? She's doing this, hoping that her husband will bring her a couple of months later. Sometimes it's a couple of years later. You come to America and you get the, what they call it, the American dream. And sometimes at that point, it's a nightmare. It's not the dream, it's the American nightmare. Then you bring your wife and then mashallah, the child is born. And Allah Musta'an, some people come to America to bring their child to be born and send them back to their country so they can yesh, yahma jinsi. So they can have the nationality. And many of us are laughing because we know people like that. So I'll just have a come here without the baby and go back. Right? So I'm from those people. No, I didn't go back to Ghana, but I was born and raised in Arlington, Texas. When I was growing up, there were many things, especially, and it really all started in fifth grade. 
Because fifth grade is when I, myself, when I was introduced to hip hop music. And that was the beginning of the end, my brothers and sisters. That was the beginning of the end. I was introduced to the culture of hip hop, to the culture of music, but not only the culture of music, and I'm not talking about music in general, I'm talking about this type of culture and way of life. In that time, there was some rappers that were well known, I mean, you probably won't even know them, but the style and the way that they moved and acted, there were shoes that were really popular back in that time. Some of you may not even know, British Knights. I don't even know British Knights shoes. Man. You yeah, got the older gentleman saying British Knights, mashallah. Adidas, troops. See, this is what was, was really, as they say, was, 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 was popping back in the day. This is what was really happening, right? And wearing your clothes a certain way, acting a certain way. It all started for me in late fourth grade, fifth grade. By the time sixth grade came around, I was doing things my parents, Allah be ali, had no idea of. Could be in the house doing that, had no idea because they didn't understand the culture. They had no idea. And I knew they didn't have an idea, so it was just, it was what they call Sprite. I was just obeying my thirst, right? Parents had no idea what was going on because they didn't understand how it was going on. At the same time, when I was young, I used to, to a certain degree, feel embarrassed to go out with my mother because my mother would wear the clothing of her culture. She would wear the African garments. And sometimes she would make me wear what they call the dashiki. <laughs> she would make me wear it. And I was just, I'm telling you, if I had to go to Kroger's or somewhere, I'm looking 360 degrees around. If anybody sees me, I'm hiding behind an aisle. I'm pushing the cart. As long as I don't see them seeing me, I'm all good. It's okay. It's not in my conscience that they see me. To where if I go to school the next day and they say, no, no, I saw you, what was that shirt you were wearing, man? It was like 6,000 different colors and a big string hanging from the top. I was like, that wasn't me, man. That was somebody else. I don't know what you're talking about. Embarrassed. I was ashamed of who I was as a Ghanaian American. When my father's and mother's friends would come over, they would speak to me in a language called tree. And they would say it to say, I cry, cry. And I'm like, um, I have no idea what you're talking about. And they would look directly at my parents and be upset that they didn't preserve the language with me. So when it came to my parents being the be doing the best that they could for what they knew, what they knew, and them attempting, there were certain things that I learned after becoming Muslim and realizing what life was all about that allows me to give some golden advice to myself as a parent and to all of you, inshallah ta'ala. And there's mainly three things that I really want to touch on, but I want to touch on it in light of a story that many of us know. The story of Ya'qub alayhi salam. Ya'qub alayhi salam. Ya'qub was the father of which, which famous prophet? Yusuf alayhi salam. Ah. Ya'qub alayhi salam, he says a very beautiful statement. He says it twice in the Quran. And I mentioned it in, in Juma earlier today. He says, for sabrun jameel. A beautiful patience. Who knows when he said it the first time? What was the first incident where he said it? When they told him that Yusuf alayhi salam was dead. How did he die? That the wolf ate him. Right? He cried wolf. And the wolf ate him. But who said that to, to Yaqub? Who told him that? His children. Because they did what? Right, because his brothers were jealous, so they wanted to kill him, right? So they plotted, and they put some, what, some blood on a shirt, and they came back to their father, and then they said, Yusuf was eaten by the wolf. So when he saw that, he responded, and he said, What was the second incident? Right, when they came back without the young one, Benjamin, Benjamin. And Benjamin was in the custody of who? Yusuf. Yusuf. But his other brothers that were plotting against him, that plotted to kill him earlier, that tried to kill him earlier, they didn't recognize that it was him. 
So he told them that he's going to keep him in his custody. Even one of the older brothers wanted to be switched, and he said he didn't want to do so, because that would be oppression. SubhanAllah. Many wisdom in, the, in this story of Yusuf So they went back and they told him, and that's when he mentioned a sabrun jameel. Again, mentioning after both times a virtue from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah may bring them back. So seeing that he said sabrun jameel upon the ma'siyah of his children. Patience. I want to mention these three forms of advice in the light of patience. That we have to be patient with our children. We have to be patient in the process of their growth in this country. We have to understand that they're going to face challenges. And those challenges that they face, inshallah, and I say inshallah, that you face those challenges along with them and that they don't face it alone. But how does that happen? Firstly, brothers and sisters, the form of advice is that you as parents have to really pick your battles. You have to pick your battles. What do I mean by pick your battles? There are going to be things, things that will be disenchanting. You're not going to like it. You may not know if it's halal or haram, but you just don't like it. This is what I'm talking about, one instance where you have to pick your battles. Do you show them your displeasure in that? Or do you think about Fasabarun Jami? When your son comes with a certain hairstyle, and the kids in school have this hairstyle, right? Or he comes with a hairstyle, long hair. And he's not intending to practice the sunnah, but he wants to look jameel. But you don't like it. Because that reminds you of how certain groups of people look. Pick your battles. Do you say something to them? Do you say, cut your hair? The mothers that see their sons, when you see them like that, do you come to them and grab their hair? What's this? But then you see, you see that he really cherishes his hair and how he's growing it. You have to pick your battles. Because if you don't, things that you don't like, whether it's mubah, it's allowed, or it's halal, it's allowed, or it's haram even. When do you display your displeasure? Because when you do that, the more you do that on a certain thing, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? It what? It's going to go away? It may not go away. The kids, the kids may go away. Right? Literally may go away, may leave the home, or they may go away mentally. You suffer, khalas. When they enter the house, they're in their own world. Guess what? They're here. And guess where the, where the door is? The door is closed. And if the door has to be open, I guarantee you they're back to the opening of the door, and they're like this. Right? They're going to travel inside of here and go somewhere else. So picking your battles is very important, brothers and sisters. It's very important that we pick our battles and how to deal with what we want to deal with with them. Knowing when to speak and knowing when not to. Sometimes when you're silent, they're, they're, they know that there will be things that you dislike from their actions. And when you're silent, subhanAllah, that is one of the strongest forms of admonition. They realize that you would say something, but you're vol you voluntarily are not saying something. That says a lot to them. And when you want to say something to them, sometimes bringing up your past and letting them know of things that you went through, the peer pressures you went through, and you give them the responsibility. You allow your children to think. You don't tell them no, why, bus, kenna. That's it. It doesn't work like that. Especially in this country, to where a lot of children want to ask what? Why? Iman, why? Five years old asking me why. Leish. It's natural. It is a natural characteristic. You cannot shun them for every time they ask you why. And let's be honest. If it's a question that you cannot, what? Answer. 
you can't answer, just be honest. That's humility. So picking your battles, brothers and sisters, when it comes to children and their friends, their friends, let's take an example. Uh, music, an ashi. Some of us as parents don't like it. Some of us as parents are okay with it. Now we have a wide range. We have the cartoons that have the ashi with no instruments. We have the cartoons that have the instruments. And now we have the new artists, the hip hop artists, right, that do the ashi. Sometimes they'll use rap beats and they'll rap over it with Islamic verses. Nice message. If you were to read it on a sheet of paper, you'd be like, mashallah, this is very contemporary. But then when you hear it, you're like, astaghfirullah, I mean, who is that? That's over a panda beat, right? Or Tupac, or somebody. But they're rapping with that, the verses that are virtuous, let's say, or good for their age group, their demographic. And you see that they have friends in school that they click with, their chemistry is nice. You don't allow it in your home, but your friend, his friend or her friend that they go over their house, their parents don't have a problem with it. And they may tell you, Fihi khilaf. In this issue, there's difference of opinion. You as a parent have a decision to make. You have a battle to pick. You have to firstly, in the beginning, in the middle, in the end, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you with the bat, to make you firm on the religion, to make you a faqih fi deen, to bless you with understanding of the religion. Al-Fatah, what does Al-Fatah mean? Who knows what Fatah? What does that mean, Al-Fatah? If we say open, what, it, what, it, what does that mean? How is that, how is that implemented on you? Give me an example, someone. It'll, it'll bring you a bath for different things, something you want to think about, but it needs a different avenue, approach or avenue maybe. He may open a door for you in something that you wouldn't think about. So when that time you're displeased with what your son is doing, you caught him listening to something, you saw on his or her phone, they left it on, they didn't press mute when they thought they pressed mute and you're listening to it, you're like, what is this? And you're like, oh, that's my friend, we listen to it. You wanna say something, but then you say something so wise, you see that it affects your son week or daughter weeks later. That is a fatah. He's opened the doors for you to articulate yourself or to act in a way that affects your son or daughter. Knowing how and when to speak especially when it comes to their friends. And I'm not talking about non-practicing friends. I'm talking about friends in the Islamic school, certain adab, you may be, there was one situation, a sister, she carpools, her children carpool with another sister to school. But this child that they carpool with, or these children that her son and daughter carpool with, they talk back to their mother and father. They curse at their mother and father on their way to Islamic school. But the mother doesn't realize that they're even cursing at her because she doesn't know them to be curse words in English. She doesn't know that when their child is being sarcastic, that it's a means of istisqa, that she's trying to put their mother down. Like when the mother speaks, they're like, yeah, okay. And they roll their eyes. Yeah, whatever. As I was saying. So when you see your child do that at home, where did you get that from? You see, oh. So they don't get in trouble, they're gonna blame who? <laughs> they're gonna blame their friend. You, have, as a parent, have a battle to pick. This is what I'm talking about. You have to choose and pick your battles. Some of them you leave to Allah and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy on you. And al-fatah, ya fatah, iftah, alayhi. Open the doors for me to be wise when I'm dealing with my children. Because you have to be wise. When they reach that age, they want to express themselves at the age of puberty. When they reach that age for the, for the girls, 9, 10, 11, 12, all the way to even 18, 20. They want to express themselves. They want to feel loved. They want to feel that they are attractive and beautiful. And if you as a father are not doing that, you are not doing that. As the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam can, you couldn't bint to Fatima. When she would enter the house, he would stand up, and when he stand up and walk to and hug her. How many of us go to our children, our daughters, stand up when they come in the house? No, we we over exaggerate. Hug them, kiss them on their cheek, tell them they're beautiful. 
If our children, if our daughters don't go to Islamic school and they may go to another school, as fathers, do we sit and we tell them, you know what, this color may not look, try another color hijab, it may look much more beautiful. If you want to wear it, that's nice. You know, you gotta get a little, along with that. We as males, as, 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 as the male figures in the house, we want to show that we are in control sometimes, natural characteristic, but this is also a jihad for us as men. Mothers, when it comes to your children, it's a jihad for you as children, as, as mothers. Knowing when to be aggressive with your son and when not to be aggressive with your son. Always remember, if there's something that there's consensus, yes. When we wake our children up for salah and they're not waking up. You know, in my house, we have a spray bottle. Well, like, we have a spray bottle. It's of water. It's reached to the degree now, you know, son's getting 12, so he's cool, right? He's, he's, he's starting to get it all figured out. He knows he doesn't have it all figured out. But he's sure that by the end of middle school, he'll have it all figured out. I'm just there to pay for him to eat and get him the clothes and the jogging pants, right? The different color socks, get him the nice haircut, make sure he plays on a good soccer or I think it's basketball team now, right? Make sure that that's taken care of, but he has it figured out. I'm just there to assist him. But he knows that when it comes to 6.15, 6 o'clock, I give him three chances. Salaam alaikum. Salat al Fajr. It's time to get up. We don't get up for school, we get up for salah. We're not going to get up because it's school time and then you pray salat taban and salat is following that. No, in the household, it's salah and everything revolves around that. If that's consistent, which we'll talk about. But if I walk in the room and it's the third time, you get the spray bottle and you, all you have to do is shake. I'll, just try it. Shake it, brothers and sisters. Just shake. They hear the water. First couple of weeks may not work, but I guarantee you, you give them a couple of sprays, they don't wake up, you get the water bottle, you shake it. Even my three-year-old, subhanAllah, he wakes up. But you're not doing it to be oppressive, aggressive. You're trying to condition them and train them, which leads me to the second point. So the first one is that we, went, we pick our battles, right? We look at the situation, look at their friends, Always be wise in what you choose and when you choose, how, do you, how you choose to say it, okay? Also with that, on this first point, I want to mention always, brothers and sisters, taking the time to speak to them not as a reaction of something that they did. And if you do, you come in a manner that is, that is, that is latif, that is nice. If you want to try to challenge this, you want to start a mind, a battle, you want to choose this one. Always taking advantage in times of rakha, in times of ease. Between Maghrib and Isha on Sunday, they know that that's your day that you spend with them, for instance. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, taking the advantage on the way home from Salah, you can really use that to benefit, to spend time, to talk to them about general principles of life. Even if you have to write it on your phone or something, tell them, okay, when I go home with my son or daughter today, I'm just gonna talk about fear. Three points on fear. And you ask them questions. Have you ever been scared of anything? When was the last time you were scared? And as I always tell parents, sometimes you can ask them, what were you thinking about when you were praying, your young child? It's okay if you were thinking about something outside of what we should be thinking about. Maybe even talk to them about what do we think about in prayer? Taking the opportunity when riding home from the salah, it's not too long, and it's not too short. It's a good amount of time that you can get them confided alone to talk about an issue that is important for them when they grow up as men or as women. So picking your battles, and secondly, brothers and sisters, is to be consistent. Is to be consistent. When we look at the prophets, alayhim wasalam, and we see the way that they were, they were consistent. They were consistent in the way they dealt with their people. We see that subhanAllah, that they were gradual in the way that they dealt with their people. Graduality. Being gradual in the way that you deal with them. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran after Adhubinna Shaykhwan Nirajim, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطُبِرْ عَلَيْهَا 
and order your family with the prayer wastabir alayha wastabir it comes from sabr patience but istibar as they say in arabic when you increase the letters on a verb that the meaning is more eloquent ziyadat al mabna tadul ala ziyadat al ma so when you increase the letters in a verb, it's much more eloquent, meaning that you have to be patient and persevere over a long period of time when you're ordering a nation, Ahluka, to pray. I remember when I embraced Islam, and every time I deal with converts, people that embrace Islam, when you tell them about the prayer, they're like, I have to pray, okay, let me get this straight, five times a day for the rest of my life? It's not like seasonal? It's not like when the Ramadan comes, we pray five times a day? Hajj, I understand that. Like, every day? Like, even when I turn, like, retire from work, I still gotta pray. Right? You have to pray five times a day, but to the best of your ability, you're gradual with them. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was gradual with the coming and the advent of Islam. La taqrabu salata wa antum sukara. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered them, do not pray, and you are in a state of what? Drunkenness. Because during the time of the companions with Allah alayhim, before they were companions, they used to what? They used to drink liquor. Heck, I'm talking about fermented, not the liquor we see for percentages. Fermented liquor. Fermented fruits. They would drink the liquor, extract strong liquor. Allah said, do not come to the prayer and you are in this state. He acknowledged the fact that they were in that state. So he was gradual with them. You, are you gradual with your children in their development of becoming Muslim men and women? Very, very important. Because we as human beings, as mothers and fathers, which is planted and based on love, we want to show them what's right. This is fine. This is natural how to actualize that in an environment that you are not used to, this is the task, hence we have this subject matter. The Prophet Sallallahu said in a beautiful hadith, and I want y'all to contemplate on this hadith. He said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مُرُوا أَوْلَادُكُمْ بِالصَّلَاةِ فَالسَّبِعِ وَضْرِبْهُمْ عَلَيْهَا بِالْعَشْرِ Who knows this hadith? Order your children to do what? To pray at the age of what? Seven. And then do what at the age of 10? Grab the stick, grab the branch from the tree, grab the extension cord, get the hot water, grab the leather belt. At the age of 10, if they don't pray, and whack them. Right? No. It's 14? At 14, you grab the stick? What would he say? The sentence is the words. No, no. <laughs> the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, order your children to pray at the age of seven and admonish them, admonish them, or show the importance of this act when they reach at the age of 10. To even where may be, be a form of aggression, but not anything that oppresses and goes against their physical right as human beings, as your children. Now when we see this hadith, brothers and sisters, there's some beautiful hikam, there's some, there's some beautiful wisdom in this. When we see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordering us to order our children to pray at the age of seven, are they held accountable in front of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala at the age of seven? Yes, no? No. No. Are they held, are they held accountable at the, in front of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala at the age of 10? No. When are children held accountable for their actions? When they're not children anymore. So? So the wisdom in this is subhanAllah that he is testing and he is raising you as a parent and your children. When we see this hadith, we always think about, oh yeah, the children, they need to at the age of seven and they better at the age of 10. But you don't realize Again, he's indirectly speaking to you. Indirectly speaking to you. Because how many parents have come to me, and maybe because, mashallah, the parents have, after a while of their development of, they weren't practicing when they were young, but when they come to America, 
they're, they're awakened by the reality of Islam as a religion and they want to start practicing. But they may have children that are 10 or that are 15 or at that age. And they come here and in a whole different world, much more freedoms to be practiced and they're gone. They're in another world. And they come and say, talk to my daughter, talk to my son. Right? But we ask, at the age of seven, when they were young, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had the, he used the fear of the Umar, he used the imperative for you all as parents. At the age of seven, start the conditioning for them in the second pillar of Islam, the best implementation of the first pillar of Islam. Start them at the age of seven. Because when the boys reach the age of 15 and when the girls reach the age of 8, 9, 10, 11, that's not when you... That's not when you're aggressive towards them to pray. Think about it. At the age of 7, 365 days a year, multiply that times 3 when they reach 10. If the majority of those days, because we're going to slip up, if the majority of those days they understand that they have to pray and wake up and before they go to sleep to pray five times a day. What do you think is going to happen by the time they reach the age of 15? It's going to be a habit. Now that can be a gift and also a what? A what? A curse. Because habits, as we say, it can be habitual to where your mind is not in it. This is why one of the wisdoms of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said the one that prays, maybe a fraction of his prayer is accepted. Because the khushur, the undivided attention within the prayer, that in and in, in of itself is a process. So imagine your children, them getting connected to God. It has to be gradual. So if Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala orders a prophet to tell you and me, to be graduate with our children at the age of seven, to where three years later, we are much more serious on this situation. When it comes to other issues outside of the prayer, why are we not gradual with them? We speak to them at this young age, and let's not just confine it to salah at seven. Other issues, Allah is bringing you the most important issue, and we do qiyas al we, we make an analogy off that on other issues on other issues. The whole concept of people leaving Islam. The, the concept of gender relations at the age of seven and eight. And this is why SubhanAllah, when having an institute or having a school that is starting to raise children based on that, on those principles, Islamic morals and principles, is incumbent upon every Muslim community. To have an Islamic school that caters to that. And I always tell parents, subhanAllah, really that environment and them hearing the name of Allah on a consistent basis, this is what is so important. That environment and hearing the name of Allah on a consistent basis is what is important. But realize that you as parents, the school is supplemental to your education at home. I'll repeat. School is supplemental. It's not essential. Does everyone understand what I mean by that? It is supplemental. What I mean is that we don't have this mentality of no implementation of Islamic values at home and we rely on the school to take care of it. To a certain degree, to where if we do that too much, we rely on the Islamic school to babysit to where we want them to go to Sunday school. And it reminds me of Christianity, subhanAllah. When I would go to church, Sunday school, Sunday is when you try to act good. But you know as soon as one, two, three o'clock comes around, you are who you are. I am who I am. That was, yeah, fine. But this is the real me. As parents, it starts at home. And having an environment that implements or that, 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 that expresses or supplicates or supplements that is, is, is important also. It's essential in a community to have supplemental elements to your Islamic household. 
This is very important. Not a house full of Muslims, but an Islamic household. That you as parents start at home being gradual. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as was mentioned, was gradual with you, being at the age of seven, you start to tell your children about the prayer. At the age of seven, after Maghrib Salah on a Sunday, you take an opportunity to pray with your family. Well, I, brothers and sisters, taking the opportunity, getting on your calendar, and being serious to the degree to where you want to pray as a family at home. Just one prayer a week and increasing that. You start with one prayer a week, a week Salat al-Maghrib on Sunday to where they have to get ready for school on Monday. And you talk about one general value in life. You bring, may bring a small hadith. You as a father may read it, have your children read it the next time and mention two or three benefits. And with your children, subhanAllah, bring life stories. You don't know what it's like, and you do actually, when your father or you as a father or a mother talk about your days when you were younger. Have you ever done that and your children are so interested? Really, you, Baba? I never would have thought of that. They're so interested. So taking advantage of that, tying it to the deen, tying it to a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, tying it to an ayah of the Qur'an. This is how you're bringing the nusus, the shari'ah, you're bringing the Qur'an and the sunnah to life in the life of your children. Why does Qur'an bring, the Qur'an bring stories? Because he knows that we will become attached to those stories. And then he brings the ibrah, he brings the lesson through the story. Where's the disconnect when we as parents want to just tell them and we expect them to get it? At the age of 15, but from seven to 15, they were never ordered to pray. They were never told the value of prayer, what it means in their life. How does this physical action get you connected to Allah? How does the fact that you're wearing this on your head make you a better Muslim? Does it make you a better Muslim? If it does, what has to be accompanied with the veil to make you a better Muslim? When we say better Muslim, does that mean better than this person? No, we're talking about between you and Allah and your status with Allah. Not when you go amongst your friends, you're better because you wear it and she doesn't. These values, if you are not talking to them about, listen closely, if you as a parent are not talking to them about these values, I guarantee you someone or something else is. Does everyone get it? Someone or something else is. And it may be good, alhamdulillah, but it may be bad. It may be bad. So be gradual with them in their development. Be gradual with them in the way that you deal with them. And through this graduality, you have to be patient. You have to be patient. You have to give them time to make mistakes. And brothers and sisters, and this is something that I want to remind you all, um, especially when we talk about uh, Islamic schools and Islamic gatherings. A lot of times we may hear of that troubled youth that comes to the masjid and he's calling other youth to do bad things. And a lot of times we may hear that there is a youth or a group of youths or a group of youth that are doing something that is not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to remember that in this country, and in any country, I mean, I lived in Saudi for eight years, okay? There's stuff that goes on there, just the same as it goes on in America. But the difference that I have to admit is that the ma'asi, the sins, are not as apparent as they are here. And that has a big role, that plays a big role, because if they are more apparent, that means it gets more publicity and exposure, therefore affecting more people around them. But with the advent of the internet, that's almost, Almost irrele an irrelevant issue. Almost. Understanding that our children, whether you like it or not, will be exposed to things that you are not pleased with. We have to embrace, understand that reality. That they will be exposed to certain things. They will be. The issue is, 
when they're exposed to it, what are they going to do about that? And that's based on that seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, 15, when they're 20, or when they're 15 even, 16. When they're faced with peer pressure and their friend makes fun of them that they don't have a girlfriend. The boys make fun of him because he doesn't have a girlfriend. Or the girls make fun of her because she's not responding to that text that she got from that guy in her class that says, you know what, you look cute in the pink hijab. Have you ever had a boyfriend before? I know you don't have boyfriends and things, but you're very beautiful. And the way that hijab looks on you is, is actually, it just makes me feel that you may be someone that I'm interested in. What is she going to do? If it's the first time she's in seventh, eighth grade, that she, somebody's told her that she's beautiful, that's a problem. That's a problem. That is a big problem. This is what I'm talking about. They may encounter these things. Do not feel that you are a bad parent if they encounter them. You cannot control that. But when they encounter those things, are they going to come to you and talk to you about it? So when I say what they do about it is based on the way that you raise them. It's partly based. And what you do about it when they come to you and talk to you, this is where the, the role of attack, a loving of attack. How wise are you going to be in your response to them? What happened? Who knows the Sahabi, his name is Ma'iz. Ma'iz, radiallahu anhu. Remember this name, especially the youth. Ma'iz. There was a young boy by the name of Ma'iz. He was not married, but he had a relationship with someone that he was not married with. A companion, this is a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So automatically, when we see that it was a companion, a youth, and the Prophet was alive, the Sunnah was living in, in front of him on a daily basis, and he still did that. What about us? He came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he told him what he did. So firstly, his action of coming to the sunnah in a state of redemption, look at how he was raised. But then the action of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you the parent, look at what he said, he turned away and he said, La'allaka qabbaltaha. He said, perhaps you just kissed her. But then what did he say after that? Ya Nabi, inni uriduka an tutahirani. I want you to purify me. Meaning that the consequence of that action, he was ready to face it, subhanAllah. Look at both in Jani Bain. It takes both the young one, the youth, and the elder to work together for that which is good. But how will the youth, will the youth come to you and talk to you if they're not raised to feel comfortable to talk to you about what they may feel may make you uncomfortable or they know you will be displeased with the action? If they don't feel comfortable and they don't talk to you, this is a bad beginning. A bad beginning. There was one time my brother was picking his, his son up. He used to pick him up and he realized, subhanAllah, that every time we pick up his son, and many of us as parents are well aware of this, we pick up our children and we, we say, you know, I want to try to talk to my son, as I mentioned, going home with him, the salah, etc. And you ask him, how was your day? What do they usually do? It was good. You're trying to get some of So, did you have fun at school today? You have recess? No. So you got homework? Yeah. You got a lot of homework? Yeah. All right, man, one more. You want to get something to eat? Yeah. No conversation. You're trying to get something out of them. Your child is like, because it's just like, they're not talking to you. They're like, man, what's their problem, right? So the brother, mashallah, he went to this course with parenting and uh, subhanAllah, they said one thing is, when you pick them up, you talk to them about your day. You tell them about your day. He said, you know what, subhanAllah, somebody was talking and they were very angry that, like the story I gave at Jumu'ah today, about the man that was on a break, he was complaining about his lunch, that he didn't get lunch, and then he went to the patient and the patient was just asking them about, are they going to be okay when they're about to get their head split open in surgery? So, you know, he told us that in the lounge and it made me real surprised and asked myself, really, what's life all about? And we gotta be thankful. You know, when you say that, they may say something. 
right? You tell them about your day and give your experience and what you've extrapolated from that experience. So the man did that one day, and subhanAllah, his son opened up. What did his son say? His son asked him a question. He said, Dad, what's a terrorist? He said, why are you laughing? He said, because that's what they're calling me, and I saw that they were calling me a terrorist. And, you know, I saw them laughing. What, 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 what is that? Opportunity is closed or open? Brothers. Opportunity is open. Wide open. First, he mentioned you something that happened, and it's very relevant nowadays. He felt embarrassed, and then he sought guidance from you. Now, if you go to say, how like kufari, so they're, they're not Muslims. Don't listen to them. They're stupid. That the solution? No. Because how do you think he's going to act to them? You know, that's where my dad said, all of you non Muslims are stupid. Uh, you need to come and pick your son up. Apparently, that he, he was saying that all of... He related to them the story of the chapter of Masih. Tabbat yada abi lahab wa tab. Abdul Rashad, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Tabbat yada abi lahab wa tab. He mentioned them the story of Abu Lahab and how the people of how Abu Lahab, who he was, his respect, and how they made fun of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and how his wife, Umra'atu Hamalat al Hatab. And most likely his son, and our, our children will know this surah. So he explained to them, Hamalat al Hatab, why she was carrying these palm fibers and wood, because she used to throw it in front of the Prophet Sallallahu house. Fi jidiha hablu min masad. Explaining that to him, and even explaining when she used to go around saying poetry about him. Muhammadun mudhammamun abayna wa dinuhu qalayna wa amruhu asayna. Right, she used to call Muhammad mudhammam. Muhammad, what does Muhammad mean? Who knows what Muhammad means? The one that is praised from Hamd, Muhammad, Muf'al, Muhammad. The one that is praised. But she would call him Mudhammam. The despised one from them. The despised one. So she would go around saying this poetry, can't you have it. So one day she wanted to throw a rock at the Prophet ﷺ because she heard this verse, one brought to him. So she came looking for him, and she couldn't find him. She came into Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr was sitting with the Prophet ﷺ, and she didn't see the Prophet ﷺ. So when she left, after threatening the Prophet ﷺ, telling Abu Bakr that she, when she finds him, she's going to do kaytu, do whatever to him. So he told him, Ala ta'ajumum amri Quraysh. He said, are you not amazed by the situation of the Quraysh? Yasubbuna wa yahjuna mudhammaman. Wa Muhammad. He said, are you not amazed by the situation of the Quraysh? They say poetry and speak badly against and curse the despised one, but I'm Muhammad. Integrity. He said the despised, basically he's saying the despised one that she's talking about, I don't know who that is. Yeah, terrorist, I don't know what a terrorist is. Why don't you tell me what a terrorist is? Right? This is what he's ingraining in his son. And it's in a surah that he's probably been reciting for how many years? But you think he's going to forget this story? It's a story! And it's tied to something that I bet you he'll start to recite more in his salah. He'll remember that situation at school, and this is how he increases his khushur. One more step from that is, oh Allah, to make dua to Allah in his salah. What have you done in a matter of five minutes on a ride home? Because the conversation has been opened. You see? This is the process of communication, effective communication with our children. Well, our effective communication can take five minutes. We think that when we go out with our families or go to guest homes, when we go in as a family unit, we do a big error. It's a big mistake that we as, that we as parents do sometimes, especially as fathers. When we all go out as a family and we go and visit another family and we say it's what? It's family time, right? How is it family time when the sisters go with the sisters and you're sitting with the brothers Tashra Boy, Wala Tashra Shay, Wala Kawa Tri Biskot? How is that family time? Tell me, how are you having effective communication with your children if you're sitting talking with the brothers and the sisters are talking with the sisters and the children are playing with the children? There is a place for that. Don't misunderstand me. But that is not, fa family time is when you're sitting as a family, as a unit, communicating together. That is family time. 
So brothers and sisters, very important that we as Muslims, as I mentioned the first point in the, in the light of patience, that we pick our battles and that we are gradual with each other and that we are consistent. That we are consistent in their development. And this, I feel, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, are the keys, the three keys to raising our children in America when we implement this practical way of them being good human beings in this society. Of them being good human beings in this society. And, and I want to end, brothers and sisters, out of all of this, you know, one reason that I don't like to do, as they say, dawah classes. Um, I believe that there should be guidelines of giving dawah, but I don't want people to get the idea of, okay, if I don't do this, then it won't work. Or if I do this, why didn't he become Muslim? It's supposed to work. No. Taking guidelines and raising your children and doing the best that you can, the only one that will know that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your children may know that much, much later when they become adults. They may not know it now, and there's nothing you can do for them to know that. Always remember, brothers and sisters, that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one that puts iman in the hearts of your children, and that is amazing if you think about it. It's totally amazing. Aren't you amazed when you see your children have different qualities? One's very serious, one's very, not that, one likes to play more, the other likes to study more. Who put that in them? And subhanAllah, there may be a quality in your son that's not in you, nor your husband, but it's in his grandfather. Amazing. Allah is the one that will put iman in the heart of your children. You are a means of that. You are our means. You are just there to help and facilitate. But you are not the one that puts Iman in the heart of your children. What is the strongest sign of that? One of them is a son of Nuh. Was a son of Nuh a mu'min? What happened? When, when Nuh told his, Nuh, a prophet, he told his son, Irkab ma'ana. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described, we're talking about Noah's ark. When Allah described the waves of Noah's ark to be the size of mountains, and you see the wisdom behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that the waves were the size of mountains, because where did his son say he was going to go? Sa'awi ila jabal, ya'simuni min al ma. billah. He told his son, oh my son, come on. Come with us, come on the, on, on the boat. And don't be from the kafirin, don't be from the disbelievers. His son said, Dad, I got to come. I'm going to go to this mountain. And look how he describes the mountain. It will protect me from the water. But then Allah describes the water to be the size of the mountain. Eloquence in the Quran. He describes what he, He's refuting even what Noah's son said. When you see that, look at your situation, youth. Do you feel you have it all figured out? Parents, look at the situation. Allah is teaching you that you don't have it all figured out either. And it is not in your total control. Allah puts the Iman in the hearts of your children. Let's go back to the hadith. Muru awladukum bi salat bi sabr. You do what you're supposed to as a parent by waking them up. Because if you don't, that's your test. You do what you can as a parent for letting them think about why they're doing what they're doing. Because if you don't, they're going to grow up and, and, and go to college and start to ask questions because I never knew why I wore this thing. I never knew why I have to pray five times a day. No one ever told me why I have to worship God and go around the black box. What does that really mean? You've never talked to them about it. And I will end with this one story, subhanAllah. A brother gave a khutbah. And after he gave the khutbah, a young boy came up to him. The boy came up to him after the khutbah. He said, uh, Ya Shaykh, mashallah, that was a very good khutbah. And there was a khutbah that a brother gave last week. And it's really making me think. And I, I want to take my shahada. So the brother was like, and he was from a, a nationality that, I mean, he was Muslim. He said, aren't you Muslim? He said, yeah, but No. My parents really never talked to me about God. But after the khutbah I heard last week, and I heard this khutbah, 
it made so much sense, you know, the concept of, 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 of Islam. And I want to take my shahada now, is that okay? He said, um, let's go back in the masjid, let's let everybody know. He said, no, I don't want anyone to know. I just want to take my shahada right now. Is that possible? He said, yeah, let's go. He took his shahada. As a born Muslim, and that's the question that I want to leave with you all, as parents, as youth. You were born Muslim, you come to this country, your children were born in a Muslim household with Muslim parents, but there's going to be an age to where the children have to ask themselves, did I embrace Islam? <laughs> that the parents have to ask themselves a question, have my children really embraced Islam? Because when they reach that age, they have a choice. Well, regardless of what you do, they have a they'll be Muslim at home. But when they go outside, they're not Muslim. Have they embraced Islam? And that's the wisdom of that hadith, brothers and sisters. Remember that hadith. Because it's showing you that even though you're raised as Muslim, they still will be converts to Islam indirectly. Because they have that choice. And that's one of the wisdoms behind Allah holding them accountable at the age of puberty. There's so much wisdom in that. Allah puts in them something at the age of puberty just as he puts in iman in their hearts. That's why he holds them accountable at that age because they will be held accountable for the actions of iman from them being primarily what? Saul. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those that are consistent in raising our children in this country. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who have intelligence and to make us of those who are wise in the way that we deal with ourselves and deal with our families. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are wise when dealing with our nephews and our other sons and daughters in the communities. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who have sabrun jameel, that have the beautiful patient, patience when dealing with things that may not please us and when dealing with the actions of obedience to be consistent. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasna wa fi al-akhirati hasna wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Does anyone have any questions? Does anyone make the other? Do you have any questions first, after questions we'll be with him. Sure. Does anyone have any questions, concerns? No, Allah subhanahu wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of his names is Al-Fatah. And Fatah comes from Fatah, and Fatah is to open. And in Arabic, when you when you increase the the wazan, when you increase it and you're adding a shadda on it, Fatah, Allah, right? It increases the, the meaning, it makes it more eloquent. And that eloquence is um, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, firstly knowing that um, Allah that there's no deficiency in any of his actions or attributes. So Fatah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the doors and opens the means for the mu'min, for the slave. So when you are in class and you want to tell, your, tell the, your youth about something and they just don't get what you're trying to tell them and something comes to you in your mind and it's like, I don't even know how I said that. But when I said it, they understood it and it sat well with them. That is an, an action of Al-Fatah upon you. When you want to tell your children about something and they're not understanding it, you're telling them about God, sometimes you want to tell them about the other, predestination, for instance, right? You don't know how to explain it to them because they're going to keep asking what? Why? Why would Allah do this, hold them accountable if, right? But then you may say something such as, does Allah know everything? Yes, Allah knows everything. So if Allah knows everything, does he know the past, present, and future? Yes, he knows past, present, and future. If he knows the future, does he know what's going to happen in the future? Right, that's predestination, that's, that's other, right? So we can't contradict ourselves when we're talking about the knowledge of Allah. So this is an explanation of, or an example of the implementation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opening the doors for people. So that could be in a way that you explain something, that could be in a way of Allah providing his risk for you, that could be in a way of you accepting that risk. So al fatah that's what it generally means, that he opens the doors for you in ways that you would least expect it. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Now, inshallah, with that, we'll end. Jazakallah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.